surprised no one got an invitation to a singing and dancing party, to be honest. Um, I'm surprised I didn't. I was looking forward to an invitation of Pastor Earl for a singing and dancing party uh, at his house with a newborn baby and all. You know, that would be fantastic. But invitations are funny things, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but... Inviting someone to something these days uh, is, I'm uh, not these, it's been the last couple of years, but it's kind of strange because you put an invitation, you send it out to your group text friends, your blue bubble people, uh, the green bubble people, I'm sorry, you get excluded because you need to get an iPhone, the, uh, the high quality phone, you know, top notch. If you're a green bubble, I'm sorry, you probably get excluded from a lot of social events because blue bubble is just easier to be in, right? But anyway, that aside, an invitation, you send out an invitation and I don't know about you, but some of the guys for our birthdays, we like to go to the grain store, trio of wings, shout out the grain store, the best wings in town, I'll tell you what. But it's our go-to and you send out a text, you put it out there and you don't, you don't expect anyone to hit you back straight away because an invitation just floats out there and you know no one's going to respond until about three hours before the event. Like it's just floating and people see it. You see that they see it. If it's on Messenger, you see little faces pop up and you're like, they've seen my events. Like what's the go? Uh, but they hold out till about three hours before and then all the excuses come in, you know, like, oh, my foot hurts. I don't know, like excuses come in. But it's because we're all holding out. So we know that everyone's holding out for like some, a better offer or something. I don't know. Or we're just afraid of commitments. I guess. I mean, I'm an offender. I've done this. I'm trying to get better at this. Um, but when it comes to, we're talking about the Holy Spirit and there is an invitation from the Holy Spirit for relationship, for deep relationship, for a joyous relationship. The Holy Spirit has put an invitation out there for us. So don't wait. Don't wait. <laughs> and, it, and it floats. And how many of us find ourselves in that moment, just like with our friends, where it's like it's been too long to respond now. It's kind of, it's awkward to respond because it's been like too long and you just, the event flies by and you just pretend it never happened. And, uh, but there's that moment, I think, with the Holy Spirit for all of us. And we have it in moments and seasons of our life where it's been a while since we've connected or we've responded or engaged in the invitation from the Holy Spirit. And we're just like, Oh, it's been, I haven't connected with God for a week. I'm, I kind of feel, is this awkward now? Like, how do I approach God? How do I approach Him now? It's been a while. Maybe it's been a week. Maybe it's been two weeks. Maybe it's been a month. Like, you love God. You're saved. You said yes to following Jesus, but you just haven't engaged for a while. And it's awkward and it's hard. And I'm telling you this morning, if you haven't done it for a while, this morning's it. This morning is it. We're going to have some moment at the end of the service where you, it might have been a year for you. It might have been a couple of years. You might be online and it might have been like five years and you haven't connected with God. This morning is it. We're a moment where you can step into the invitation that God has sent to you. An invitation to connect with Him this morning. But we all do it. We get into the grooves and habits of our life and that invitation's there and we know and we just, we come to church. But you see, God didn't send His Son to die for us so that we would be well-mannered, non-swearing, well-dressed church people. <laughs> he didn't. And so we can come every Sunday. We can do... I don't know, Bible studies, connect groups, and never respond to that invitation from the Holy Spirit. But that's it. It's the invitation that we need to, we need to break out of whatever's stopping us, and we need to engage with God with our life. We need to process our inner world, the inner workings of our life with the Holy Spirit. Because last night, Pastor Nate, uh, last week, what did I say last night? <laughs> last week. Last night. Last night we played Mario Kart. It was fantastic. Uh, you, I won too. <laughs> Pastor, Nate, Pastor Nate broke down the fact that the Holy Spirit is approachable. He, he's not an it, he's a who. He's, he, he's, he's personal. And this morning, and I'm going to go through it quick, I just want to expand on that and I want to break down ways in which we can practically engage in relationship with the Spirit of God. 
just practical. I'm, I'm going to be real practical. Like, and if, you're, uh, if you don't like practicalities, I mean, who doesn't like practicalities? But practical stuff is spiritual. If you look at the Bible, there's so much practical stuff in there. God gave so many instructions about the temple. And, and one thing I remember Pastor Keith telling me years and years ago, which really stuck with me. It was great. I mean, you, there's lots of things Pastor Keith said that have stuck with me. But you know how when we, come, we talk about spiritual things and we kind of get a bit, you know, oh, it's got to be organic. It can't be practical and structured. And it's got to be organic. And I used to be a little bit like this. I love organic. Don't get me wrong. I mean, organic and free flow. But Pastor Keith said the most organic things in the world trees, plants, forests, if we look at how God made it, there's structure to it. There's purpose to it. There's intention to a tree that has cell structures that operate in community in the forest. And God has created organic things. When we think of organic, it's actually structured and well-intentioned and purposed. And so when it comes to practical stuff in our life, we can't be scared. Well, I miss that. I miss that on the front row. So, I've got a few points this morning. So get your iPhone out. No one's got notepads anymore, I'm sure. Notepad? We've got some paper, paper, notepad, good. Get your notepads out. I've got kind of three main points this morning, classic. Classic three main points and there's some sub points within those. But I just want to, this morning, I just want us to want to remind ourselves that we, if you're a believer, if you're a born again believer, you are fully alive. You go, I don't, I don't experience that. It doesn't matter. It's the truth. You are fully alive. And whether you have stepped into the reality of that experience or not is a different matter. It's the truth. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how you woke up this morning. It doesn't matter what you've, you've been doing. If you're a child of God, if you said yes to following Christ and the, you said yes to the message of the gospel, you are fully alive. And if I was the enemy, which I'm not, I'm not, if I was the enemy and I knew that this truth is sealed, done, Christ did it on the cross, what I would try to do, I would try to convince every believer that they aren't fully alive. I would try to distract them from the reality that they are fully alive. I would try and hinder everything I can from allowing them to step into the experience of life with Christ because He can't do anything about the truth because Christ in Colossians it said He... He made a spectacle of every power and authority on the cross. So he can't do anything about that. But if he can convince you that you're not alive spiritually, if he can convince you that you're kind of like, you are spiritually dead. And I'll tell you what, he can lull us into kind of a, an apathy and a sleep where we never activate. We might, we might end up in eternity with him, but on this planet, on earth right now, we'll never activate into the full expression of the life that Christ has called us into. And so this morning, these practical things I want to talk about is not how to like become fully alive because we are fully alive. It's how we can keep in step with the Spirit so that we can experience the full life that He has called us to. So we can, we can experience the reality of actually what's on the inside of you. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. We're not working towards being fully alive. We're... We, we want to do some practical things so that we set our minds on what Christ has already said. Richard J. Foster said, Superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The de desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. He wrote that 30 years ago, I believe. Um, so <laughs> he was on the money. Point number one. Quick recap of Pastor Nate. The Holy Spirit likes being personal. He likes being personal. John 14, 16 in the Amplified Version, it's gonna be on the screen. He says, and I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper. He ex expands in the Amplified. Comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby to be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not, does not see or know him, but you know him because the Holy Spirit remains with you continually and will be in you. That's personal language. Comforter. I love it. Comforter, counselor, strengthener, advocate. 
John 16, verse 7. I'm going to skip one of the scriptures, AV team. This is, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, however, I'm telling you that uh, nothing but the truth when I say it is profitable for you that I go away because I, if I do not go away, the comforter, counsellor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby will not come to you in close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I'll send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. He is personal. And so we need to readjust our lens and know that he is personal. He is not this impersonal force like, you know, Star Wars. It's not the force that's just like the force is out there and we have to figure out the right like moves in church, the hands and like the the right voice inflection when we pray to kind of make the spirit do something. No. He's a he's personal. God God actually created us to be personal. If we are created in the likeness of his image, we kind of get a hint to how personal the Holy Spirit might be also. He existed in community before the foundation of the world in the Trinity. So he is personal. He's not an impersonal force. And so a relationship revolves around being personal with someone. If I'm not personal with my wife, it's not a good relationship. If I don't engage in a relationship that requires time, trust, sacrifice, intentionality, then it's not really a great, healthy relationship. And so when we approach the Holy Spirit, we can approach Him in the same way that we approach not all relationships. Obviously, it's God, it's the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit different. But it's someone that we get to process our inner life with. And that is the relationship. The Holy Spirit is not just someone that we rattle off a whole bunch of wants and needs and things to. He's not just a powerful force that we command to like bring blessing into our lives and things like that. No, He is personal. And this morning, I wanna encourage you to engage in, with the Holy Spirit in a very personal way. It requires being vulnerable, letting Him know how we feel letting him know what's going on on the inside. He is someone that I can process my inner life with. He's someone that I can get to know. He is someone that I learn to trust, follow and surrender, obey daily. I'm still on my journey in my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us are. And so for my experience and relationship with the Holy Spirit, I want everyone to think of like a favourite sport. Think of your favourite sport. It could be um, bobsledding. Anyone been watching the bobsledding? No? Oh, jeez. Anyone watching the Winter Olympics at all? All right. Your favourite sport. Think of your favourite sport. Now think of someone who is like, who you idolise in that sport, who you just absolutely love. You follow them. They're incredible. They're amazing. Like if you could be like them in that sport, think of that person. Now, if that person said to you, hey, I think you've got the goods to be the world's best bobsledder or whatever it is that you're thinking about, right? Is, is it bobsledding for anyone? Come on. No, all right. Gee, it's pretty incredible. Uh, it's not my favourite sport, though. It's all right. But think of that person. They say, you've got the goods. I can see it in you. So says, I want you to apprentice under me. I want you to train under me. I want to get to know you. I'm going to live with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to tell you how to train. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. I'm going to know the inner workings of your life. I'm going to help you recalibrate things to change. And this person that you idolise, who you look up to, who you think they're incredible in their sport, you would listen to them, right? You would trust them. You'd believe what they're saying. You wouldn't want to disappoint them. And when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I think it's really, really similar. Not, not like a coach, but a close like mentor in our life. Like a, a mentor friend, not like a bro friend. Not, hey, so, you know, Holy Spirit's not really like that. He's, he's, he's leading us. But he's like a close mentor. And so we can engage with the Holy Spirit in that way because he sees he sees how God, the, the, the kind of culmination of what God has called, how God has, who God has called you to be. And he wants to grow and challenge and, and see you move towards the person God has called you to be. And this is the relationship that we engage with. So point number two. Point number one was he is into being personal. We have to engage with him on a personal level. Point number two is he is into being practical. 
Like I said before, he is into being practical. And I think our habitual life is closely linked to our spiritual life. Our habits are closely linked to the state of our spiritual life. You see, our habits do not earn us God's attention. They don't earn us God's attention. We can't do good habits to earn God's favour and attention. So our habits do not earn us God's attention, but they help us give Him our attention. I'm going to say it again. Our habits do not earn us God's attention, but they help us give Him our attention. I get in trouble so much when I don't give Jess attention. And she's like, she's not needy, but like, she's not. She's actually fantastic. But sometimes I have this habit of like not looking at her while she's talking to me. Because I want to, like, I can't sit still. I've got to do stuff. Our best conversations are in a, like a long drive somewhere, like to Sydney. Because half my brain is focused on one thing and half I can, I can, I can listen. But like if you say, sit down and listen to me and look at my face. I'm, oh man, that is the hardest thing in the world to do. I just squirm and like, I can't. Does anyone relate? Come on. Amen. And, um, but if I don't give just attention... I'm not going to engage in what she's trying to tell me or how she feels and vice versa. That's a conversation. And so we need to align our attention to God. If we want to live a deep and abundant life in connection with our designer and creator, a life overflowing with abundant realities of the kingdom, we have to replace our habits towards pleasure and distraction which I think is probably the greatest barrier in most of our lives when it comes to connecting with God. We have to replace our habits towards pleasure and distraction with habits towards God. They used to be called spiritual disciplines, but it sounds a bit hardcore. So I like to say that they're habits towards God. They recalibrate our life towards the person of the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of our habits take us away from engaging with the Holy Spirit. Habits help usher our head and our hearts towards God. James Clear has this fantastic book called um, Atomic Habits. This is great. Who's read Atomic Habits? It's a pretty big seller. I've paraphrased one of his quotes to make it better. (laughs) He doesn't include God, so I included God. I said our habits produce the compounding interest of a robust and abundant spiritual life, cultivating a deeper relationship with God. So instead of just sitting around hoping that God's going to come upon us and make everything fantastic, I think we've got to do a bit of work in the relationship sometimes. Because from what I read, the Holy Spirit, God has done all the work. It's on us to do a bit of the work. And it's not earning His attention, it's helping us give Him our attention. Colossians 3 says, Colossians 3, 3, it's on the screen. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in His resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things not on things that are on earth, which may have temporal value, for you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you'll also appear with Him in glory. So, two practical things we can do, and we could go on for ages. We need to create more space. If you had a dietitian and you're trying to get healthy, they would say, journal, journal your, your, the week of your food. Right? Journal what you eat. Because then you're going to be able to survey what you're actually doing. You're going to be surprised that you eat a pack of Tim Tams a night and your nutritionist or whatever is going to say, that's probably, you can't really, that's not good. How good are Tim Tams? Like you see the two star rating or the 1.5 and you're just like, oh, that's too good. Who cares? (laughs) Um, Right? Not too often. But if we survey our week, and I challenge you to do this, do, this is practical. This, I'm being like boot camp trainer to, this today. Get a journal and write down this week how much Netflix you watch. 
write down, or Disney Plus, whatever, choose your poison, whatever it is that you binge or, or whatever kind of entertainment, whether it's gaming, whether it's Mario Kart, whether it's Netflix, write it down how much you watch that week. Not to feel bad, it's just to survey where your time goes. Have a look at your screen time. Where's it go? Does it go to uh, Instabook Face or TikTok? I heard that on a movie, it sounded funny. Um, it was a kid's movie. It was good when they did it, but... How much time do you spend on Facebook? TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram? Have a look. Journal this. This is the practical stuff because this is the stuff that takes us away from God, like it really does. It distracts us from God. So survey, have a look at it, and then at the end of the week, sit down with a cup of tea or whatever, a Tim Tam, and <laughs> put some worship music on, or some Donda, whatever you like, Kanye. No, I shouldn't say that. And just sit with God and have a look at your week. And go, God, what do you think about this? <laughs> just be real with Him. And let Him challenge you like a great mentor will that only has your best interests at heart. Let him go, yeah, look, you watch a lot of Netflix. <laughs> like, and that, that's probably not a good show. Like, you know, you're not really setting your mind on things above. Like, but it's got a good storyline. I love Judah Smith said, I'm just not in that much need of entertainment because it's not going to satisfy our soul. It's not going to do anything. It's a lie that says, oh, it's going to make me relax and feel good. And, and sometimes it's okay. But like when we're binging certain things, it's just, it's not. So let the Holy Spirit in that place. Create space. If you're on Instagram, delete Instagram. If, you're, if social media is ruling your life, delete it. Like this is life with God. What is more important? What are we going to do? Like, this is all temporal stuff. So whatever it is, create space. Clear the decks. You know, I wish I had desks with all paperwork these days, but we've just got a computer, you know. Clear the desk. Get angry. Get fired up. That's it. I'm changing things. Make space. And then be intentional. Be intentional like training for a sport. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, don't you realise that in a race everyone runs, but only the person, one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that'll fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. Let's run with purpose. Life is short. I'm not just shadow boxing. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. If we want to enter into a deeper level of relationship, we're going to be like a, a disciplined athlete. Cut things away out of our life. Cut it out. Cut it out. I'm going higher. I'm going to another level with the Holy Spirit. I'm going deeper in relationship with Him. And if I need to lighten my load and I need to cut some things off, then do it. Get brutal about it. Get some accountability. Help pe bring people in on your decisions that you're going to make around this. For physical training is of some value, but godliness is value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. As for now and later. Practice new ways of connecting with God. Some of us know how to connect with God and worship, music, sound. And if that's the only way we connect with God on a Sunday, which is great, it's better than nothing. It's a bit 2D. Develop a more robust, practice ways of talking to God. Verbally journal in the car. Let God know how you feel that day. Practice it. It might be weird for you. You might be really good at ticking off your Bible plan, but this part's not good. Practice this part. Develop this part. If you're not good at the worship part, practice the worship part. Engage with God in worship and being in His presence. Plan, be intentional. When I go for a long run on a Saturday morning, I need to think about it the day before. 
I need to get my shoes ready, my, my clothes laid out, my coffee set up so I don't wake up the kids. I need to get it all ready, my alarm set. I'm like, I need to go to bed early so I can get up early and do my long run. Plan to spend time with God. Carve out time. Think about it the night before. Maybe staying up too late is like your weakness. Cut that out. Change your habits. Form habits towards God. Practice other modes of connecting with God. Talk to Him. Go for a walk. Get out of the house. Walk down at the beach. Go to the park. Go to the lake. Drive around in your car. Find different ways because every single one of us connect with God in a kind of a different way. So find your thing. Don't settle until you find your thing. And point number three is that He's part of the process. He's part of the process. A relationship isn't a destination. It's not a destination. It's a journey. And, we, and there's ups and there's downs. And, there, and we grow in relationship. Jess and I have grown over the last 10 plus years that we've been married. We've intentionally had to do work. We've intentionally had to let go of things that were habits we used to do, which might separate us or keep us apart. You know, when you first get married, you've got to learn to kind of do life together rather than just doing separate lives together to bring you together. And we have to do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. So no matter where you are in your journey, in relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's okay. Because He's in the process with you and He's with you wherever you're at in the journey. So it doesn't matter if you're way down here or you're just at the beginning. Just engage with the Holy Spirit because He's part of the process. I love, uh, in Pastor Darren's marriage book, actually, there he is. It's pointing at like all different people down here. There's a quote from Dr. Alan Meyer. It says, marriage is the triumph of infam- uh, intimacy over perfection. How good is that? Marriage is the triumph of intimacy over perfection. And that's what we get to do with God. We are growing in our relationship with Him and growth does not demand perfection. God does not demand perfection. That cost was paid. That cost was perfection, that was Jesus. He did it. That's why Paul says, I count everything garbage except for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Everything garbage. All His accomplishments, His intellect, everything is garbage except for knowing Christ. He's looking forward to a growing connection with you a growing, developing connection with you. You see, and I want us to stand up this morning because we're going to spend a moment to connect with God. Let's stand up. Can the band come on out? You know, our headline scripture for this series, John 10.10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. And we shouldn't be unaware of his tactics to distract and take us away from having a habitual life towards God. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And this morning, we're just, it might be, it might, may have been a while since you've connected with God. Sorry, I lost my spot. But this morning, there's that invitation I don't know if it's a blue bubble or a green bubble. I don't think God does that. But there's an invitation from the Holy Spirit. And it might have been a while. But He's here. He's personal. He's engaged. He's, he's, he likes the process. He doesn't, he doesn't matter if you're an infant in the process or you're mature in the process. He's, just, he's, not, he's not reluctantly waiting kind of for your response to His invitation. Now he's eagerly awaiting your response to his invitation. Just like the father and the prodigal son. He's like, God's there, his invitation's there, and the green bubble is, you know, the, not the green bubble, the, the little dots, the three dots, da, 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 where you're like, come on, respond. God's like, he's excited. He's like, it's been a couple of weeks, but I'm excited for you to respond. I'm excited for you to engage. Come on. And this morning is that invitation because relationships are engaging with the person of Jesus through adversity 
valleys, dryness, victory, mountaintops, apathy, disappointment, revelations, breakthrough, tiredness, confusion, outpouring, blessing and sadness. We do all of these things with Him. We do it with Him. It's not dependent on how perfect or good we are. He's done that work. So come on, right now, in the few minutes that we have, the invitation is there. Step, it's just, all it requires is for us to step into it this morning. And the conversation in your head towards the Holy Spirit might simply be, hey, it's been a while. It's been a while. But I'm here. But I'm here. So come on, let's just, whatever you need to do this morning, just raise your hands. Have that conversation with the Holy Spirit right now. Because everything we're looking toward to fill us, it's all found in our relationship with Him. Let's just talk to Him right now. Let's tell Him, I haven't been doing well. I need you. Let's tell Him, I've been distracted. I've been too distracted. I, ha- I, I, I need you, Holy Spirit. I want you, Lord. You might be disappointed with God. Tell Him. Tell Him you're disappointed with Him. God can handle it. God's pretty, He's God. <laughs> you might be angry. Whatever it is, God already knows what's going on in the inside of your life. But he's looking for you to share it with him. Thank you, Lord.